March 17, 2021. On this date, a blogger from Myanmar Resistance Group writes, We woke up to the news of terrorist army setting fire to a residential area, resulting in the damage of three houses, including a house of a well-known painter, Win Pimient. Although the painter and his family are safe, almost half of his art pieces were destroyed. The incident reminds us of the past not long ago. No art, no culture, just fear. Everyone in the country feel unsafe day and night, as even those who weren't in the protests have been detained and shot for no apparent reason. My former student, Maung Jan, now on the ground resistance in Myanmar, explains that this conflict is just a product of 67 years of violence, producing 479,000 refugees, 810,000 stateless individuals, and 1.2 million in need of immediate humanitarian aid. On to the next event, December 8, 2016. Around four years earlier, another violent event happened in Payatas, Quezon City, Philippines, a garbage dump parish where I work. Juan was shot in front of his children after serving them breakfast. He still begged for his life, but the armed men did not listen. Instead, they landed four more bullets in different parts of his body. In this populist Duterte regime, the police force themselves into houses and just shoot people in their list of drug users and peddlers. As of this writing, there is an estimated 33,000 deaths in Duterte's war on drugs in the Philippines. I narrated these two ground events in order to give face to myriad forms of conflict and violence on the Asian soil. Chapter 7 of Fratelli Tutti, whose main concern is peace and reconciliation, can be relevantly read from the context of these events on the ground. I will comment on three areas which are relevant to the Asian situation. One, extrajudicial killings and death penalty. Two, the morality of war and three, healing and reconciliation in post-conflict societies. First is the extrajudicial killing and death penalty. Fratelli Tutti 267 talks about extrajudicial or extra-legal executions. Though the quotation comes from his address in 2014, by quoting it at this time in the encyclical, one could not help but feel that the Pope is referring to the Philippine phenomenon and similar events worldwide. The Pope discusses extra-legal executions in the context of the issue of the morality of death penalty. Fratelli Tutti fights for the abolition of death penalty worldwide. On November 17, 2020, the United Nations resoundingly voted on the moratorium on capital punishment. But 11 countries out of the 39 who voted against the resolution were from Asia. One author says, that Asia is the global outlier on death penalty issue. However, 
Fratelli Tutti has sharply pointed out the dangers of death penalty in authoritarian states, many of which are found in Asia. It only shows that Asian societies are still far from Pope Francis' vision of a world without capital punishment, as he puts even life imprisonment into a bad light, the latter being a secret death penalty itself. Second is the morality, or more appropriately, the immorality of war. Asia is highly charged and militarized region. There are international potential hotspots in the Asian region that can escalate into war among interested countries. I would like to use the South China Sea dispute, or as we call in the Philippines, the West Philippine Sea dispute as example. China's economic interest in the area is obvious. Despite a favorable ruling by the UNCLOS, or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, by its permanent court of arbitration at The Hague, on the sovereignty over the area in July 2016, China today continually rejects the decision. It continues to reclaim the islands or create new ones, install military installations, and more recently, deploy warships in the disputed area. This move can trigger larger players like the United States, whose economic interest on the disputed West Philippine Sea as a trade passage or as a substantial source of natural gas is not a secret. Three large superpowers, United States, China, and Russia, have their strategic interests in the region. Question, will these and other hotspots trigger the next world war? This is a big chilling question in the Asian region. Reading Fratelli Tutti from the perspective of his highly charged context makes its principles a stinging critique to international geopolitical positioning in Asia. For instance, humanitarian excuses to wage war have been summoned in the past to attack a country, the Iraq War, for instance. But we know these are just excuses. And they attacked Iraq anyway, to the death of thousands of innocent civilians. Second, no one can really control the risk of nuclear and biological warfare. For these reasons and more, Fratelli Tutti rejects the long moral tradition and discourse of the just war theory from St. Augustine up to our times. It discards the war as last resort position in the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church. The third point is about the process of healing and reconciliation in post-conflict societies. In Asia, we can easily think of the following locations. Cambodia after the defeat of the Khmer Rouge, Timor-Leste after the withdrawal of Indonesia, Sri Lanka after the capitulation of the Liberation Tamil Tigers, Afghanistan after the withdrawal of U.S. troops and the Mindanao area of southern Philippines. In these parts of the world, Pope Francis writes, 
there is a need for paths of healing to heal open wounds. The central themes dealt with in the encyclical are not new. They are based on decades of peace-building practices which international politics and the academe have dubbed as transitional justice. Pope Francis talks about four main points. One, the role of truth and memory. Two, the need for a viable roadmap for post-conflict dialogues and negotiations. Three, the centrality of the human person and the common good. And four, the critical role of forgiveness. The last one is crucial to the Asian context. Even as we are called to forgive everyone, the Pope says, justice needs to be rendered in socio-political situations. We need to confront criminals, corrupt political officials, and those who trample people's rights and human dignity like tyrants and dictators. Fratelli Tutti 241 is particularly helpful in the highly authoritarian Asia. To quote, he says, true love for an oppressor means seeking ways to make him seize his oppression. It means stripping him of a power that he does not know how to use and that diminishes his humanity and that of others. We have shown the relevance of Chapter 7 of Fratelli Tutti in the Asian continent, a region marred by violence and conflict. Beyond the themes mentioned in the encyclical, however, there are situations on the Asian grounds which can provide a critique or suggest other ways of its contextualization. First, even as truth-telling, remembrance and forgiveness mentioned in the encyclical are ne necessary in peace-building, there are other social conditions of possibility for these processes to happen. In a world where armed groups dictate everyday lives of people, there is a need to insist first on the rule of law. In a world where judges and lawyers have to run for their lives, basic political institutions first need to be created with effective structures of transparency and accountability. In a world where people are so poor and could be easily swayed by armed politicians, peace can only start with capacity building through education, access to employment opportunities, food and environmental sustainability, and basic physical infrastructures. In short, these social and political structures are conditio sine qua non for peace and reconciliation to happen on the ground. Second, to establish fraternity and social friendship, peace building processes must be built from ground up. Grassroots dialogue movements in the context of people's daily lives are necessary to counter long-held prejudices and break ideological, religious, and cultural barriers. For example, among the people of Southern Mindanao, citizens themselves unilaterally declare their villages and schools as peace zones and prevent the military from bringing guns in the area. Some indigenous communities designate women to be their peacemakers. Other schools, for instance, have peace tables. 
when two or three students quarrel, they have to go to the peace table at the back of the classroom to settle their differences. These small scale and people-led initiatives augment the high-profile dialogues of leaders and peacemakers. In conclusion, just as Fratelli Tutti's challenge of peace and reconciliation is very relevant to the Asian context, our own experience of peacemaking also provides a critique and augmentation to the document's universalist direction. Asia's specific history of conflict and its present volatile situation needs to be closely watched as it can escalate to local and international war. On the one hand, the absence of the rule of law and viable political institutions, even in post-conflict societies, can bring back local and military elites as it presently happens in Myanmar. Or an international clash of power within the region. An old maxim goes this way. If you only have a hammer, sooner or later, most problems would look like nails. So, given the growing military arsenals in the area, military option is not a remote possibility to settle disputes and achieve political objectives. In this context, the more should Asians heed Pope Francis' call to fraternity and social friendship. Thank you.